Cool. Uh, so, uh, uh, so Aaron's going to lead us tonight, our conversation of chapter number seven, correct? Yeah. So we're going to talk about chapter number seven, our code here. Um, I'm just going to do a couple of uh, quick reminders here for everybody, and then I'll just kind of turn it over, and then we'll just kind of start our discussion for this evening. So again, everybody's been in a session, but just as a quick reminder, you know, if if we need to slow down at any time and discuss, you know, just let the speaker know. Um, don't be afraid to, you know, jump in and, and ask questions or add to the conversation at any time. Again, we're here. We're all here to learn. So um, don't feel like you're dominating the conversation or anything like that. Like if you have something to say or you have a question, most likely someone else is going to have that same question. So take the opportunity to do that. I think we're a pretty open group here. Uh, last week was a great example of it. Like we had a really good discussion last week. So definitely don't be afraid to jump in at any time. Uh, camera, everyone knows about that. You know, that's optional, but encouraged. These sessions are recorded and they've been uploaded to YouTube. So just kind of keep that in mind. And then I was looking at the schedule just a little bit, just to kind of keep everybody in front of it. Next week will be eight. Isabella um, has herself uh, listed here for taking on those re speaking responsibilities. I don't see her here tonight, but I'll catch up with her to make sure she's still good to cover chapter eight. Um, and then uh, I think I'll take chapter nine for that because I haven't spoken in a while and it looks like um, nobody signed up for that. But those are the stuff that's coming up so far. So, all right, with that, I'm going to turn it over and we'll start a discussion for tonight. So. Mm. Okay. Is now you should make the text a little bit large. Is this good? Okay. So we're going to talk about the seventh chapter, which is our code. And so the main learning objectives for this uh, chapter are how do we organize code? in files in a package uh, how do we maintain a consistent style and the meat of the main the meat of the chapter is basically understanding the difference between uh, code as we run it in a script versus code as we uh, use it in a is in a package uh, and there are some uh, significant differences that we have to be aware of and then this chapter, like other chapters, I think is peppered with some reminders about uh, best practices for like workflows. So the first thing is about organizing functions into files. And there's only one real hard rule. That is all function definitions have to be in, of course, R files, but those R files have to be in a directory called R in your uh, package directory. That is the only hard rule. And besides that, there are conventions that are typically used. Uh, file names should be meaningful and the name should convey what the functions actually do. There are two extreme uh, about how you can organize functions into files. One is that you could make a separate file for each function and name that file uh, by the name of the function. Or the other extreme is dump all your functions into one file. And both of those extremes are something to avoid. Uh, generally, there are you want to group certain functions together. Uh, and the way uh, so if, if you want to do one function for one file, that is for really large functions typically. So that's this one function in one file is for really large functions. Or this other case is where uh, that function doesn't neatly fit with any other functions. Then you could do that. And an example of that is the uncount function in type here. And, and there are... Uh, Another way of grouping is you, you put one main function and all its supporting fun functions in one file. And one and an example of that is the tidyr separate function. And this is the this is that function. So lots of documentation 
this is the main function here and we have a bunch of helper functions they're all in one part then the other way to group functions is by related all family of related functions in one file an example of that is this there's no function called rectangle but there are a bunch of functions that have to do with rectangling like unnesting and hoisting data into a data frame list columns into data frames and all those functions are listed in here in rectangle so the this is all hoist uh unless longer unless wider and unless and so on so these are all in one file uh we already talked about this and in, in addition to that if you have some small helper functions that are used across multiple files uh by convention they are put in this file called utils that are this is one of those reminders that are peppered in the chapter about uh, uh workflows this is a reminder to basically uh when we are uh, developing code we want to uh, get feedback as fast as possible so we can like, iterate through different versions of a function or like test different things as quickly as possible and uh we've talked about this function a few times before this load all function which basically uh emulates like the namespace of a package uh, and gives you access to all the functions in the package that you're, uh, you, you're developing so this is a reminder to use this as frequently as possible every time you're uh, developing uh, writing functions load all test change so on next is maintaining a consistent style for code so there is uh, what style to maintain and uh, why is in this style your style guide i actually find it really helpful and I, I keep going back to this document frequently uh, it just really helps uh, there are some like really small things and some uh, like i'm sure a lot of you have already have seen this but maybe um yeah, just like syntax for example just like naming practices for stuff and where to put spaces where not to put spaces and stuff like that uh, just conventions that are followed by everybody and other practices another one that I generally go to go back to frequently and I really like, but it's not particularly related to this, but I often go to these like together and I wanted to just mention it in case anybody is not aware of it is this diverse design guide. And I really like this, which uh, gives like the philosophy, uh, uh, like the design philosophy behind like how to uh, write functions and stuff like that. Uh, then so the what and why is in this study was style guide but uh, there is a package that actually can do all that job for you called the style r package i haven't actually used this package so i don't know exactly how it works uh, but you can basic so what i mean by i don't know how it works is like i don't know what it means to restyle a package maybe to like conform it to like the uh, uh, the templates that we've seen so far in the book is what i assume the name uh, restyle like directly uh, but this is this is i think what i'm like i i guess i know what they mean it's like uh, making sure the syntax is right but a selected piece of text to the file uh, i don't know has anybody used this style of package no. well i was gonna say i have i have a uh, note that comes to mind with when i was reading this section um if anybody has used adam as a text editor 
uh, there is a, a service or a function called beautify Atom. And what that does is it, like if you had an HTML code or, or a HTML file and all of your tabs are just all over the place or your spaces are all over the place, what beautify does is it goes through and it, it uh, nests everything in the proper format of, of what an HTML file should be. Uh, things that come to mind are JSON files or some form of XML where tab delimitation is important. And if you don't have that uh, feature, that spacing feature, um, there's other things that'll error out on. The second one that came to mind, and this is a different subject, and I'm not sure if I can think of a use case where I've witnessed it outside of work, but um, some of our, our uh, software requires certain configuration files to be in the Unix file format. And if you were to save it in an MS-DOS format, the end of line character format, um, it'll error out. Uh, so unfortunately, when you're developing on a, on a Unix-based system, but you're, sorry, you're running it on a Unix-based system, but you're authoring most of your content in a DOS format, uh, you have a real strong tendency to save the file incorrectly. And then if you try to run that on that Unix interpreter, it will just blow up. And so that's another error that we have to watch for, uh, or at least I remind our staff uh, that they have to, to do that. Both of those comments uh, come to mind when I was reading this list of different style R type things. There's a reference in that style guide talking about lint R. So a linter is, is just a filter. It, it's, it's looking for the formatting of your code. Um, Colin, do you remember in one of the Mastering Shiny book clubs, there was a tool or a service that you had deployed where we were discussing the length of a line of text. So uh, there's a comment in, in that style guide, paragraph 2.5, talks about long lines and it says limited to 80 characters. Do you remember what that vertical bar was that you had uh, created? Do you remember what that was? Oh, uh, well, like there's like, it's, I don't think it's really related to like the style art, but there is like, there's like snippets, like there's like in the global options, there's snippets that's, that are developed in, or that are just like stock within like our studio that you can set up. And then they had the 80 character bar in it. And I, I set that up. I did that before until I knew that there was some other convenience, like functions and key bindings that you could do to like automatically like wrap things within 80 characters. And so people who aren't familiar, like a general coding practices to like keep everything within 80 characters, you know, keep everything, all your lines within 80 characters. There's debate on whether you should care about that or not, but um, there are some things that you can do to set up to make sure that you have that bar. Um, I, am I answering your question, Ryan? You are. That's exactly what I was thinking about. And, and it's, it's the styling of your code is what uh, uh, this particular section of the chapter uh, I was thinking about all of the references that we've discussed in the past about this. Well, that was the other question that I had too, was like, what, like the difference, cause I hear of lint or, you know, I hear of linters, you know, like in other languages. So I was just wondering if like style R, like the style R package is just like a linter, but it's just called style R. It, that's, I don't, I don't know if anybody's familiar with other stuff like that, but that's where I was got kind of confused of if they're the same or if they're different. I wouldn't consider it a at runtime notification like, like a linter would be. Um, I'm thinking this is like after the fact, the reference that they made in the text was uh, setting up a GitHub action so that when you post your code base uh, and then Crayon receives it or, or some developer, some other person is looking for it, then it will automatically change the style of your code. Uh, so it, it kind of nullifies maybe a sloppy uh, person or I don't want to use, I don't want to identify or, or indicate that somebody's sloppy. Um, it, it ensures that everything looks and feels the same as it's being deployed to a larger audience. Does that make sense, Colin? The difference yeah. between a linter and a, and a styler. So you're, oh, you're, oh yeah. your okay, linter go ahead, is sorry. like real time, yeah. Okay, so a linter is like when you push it into your version control, like it's CI, CD stuff, like continuous integration, continuous nope. development. No, I consider linters like almost like a spell checker, but only with syntax. So like if you misspell a word mm. and your spell checker highlights it and says, hey, you do want to correct it to a different spelling, right? You have a dictionary that goes along with that. 
A linter is in a similar capacity where it's looking at the formatting of your code. Did you tab incorrectly? Did you use particular, you know, square brackets, curly brackets, whatever the, the format is of the, uh, the script you're running uh, or writing? Um, that would be more of a linter type style of, of error checking. This style R package that we're referring to or using it in a GitHub Actions material would be even though I've uploaded something that isn't quite accurate by the time it reaches or commits to the GitHub Action and then the background runs through it and it it, it uh, formats it in the proper form uh, the proper way, kind of like that that beautify Atom concept. Um, mm -hmm. You have to execute it. You have to tell it to run that that uh, uh, formatter. Uh, it doesn't do it just automatically. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. I don't use this. I just basically use like the command I or whatever the shortcut is to just, just get the indentation right. But that's just great. Yeah. But I, shift shift command A, isn't it? Shift command A is the one you highlight your code, shift command A, and then it it does all the identification on Mac at least. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So understanding when code is executed. I think this is, I think we talked about this a little bit in the last chapter also. Uh, uh, but this is the, I think, uh, one of the more important parts of the chapter is we have there is a difference between scripts and packages as to when the code is run. In scripts, the code is run when you run it, either non in, either interactively in like your IDE or non interactively with like our script. But that is when the code is run. But the coding package is run when the package is built. So. So this is I I stole this from I think the second chapter uh, uh, file. So this is the so if you are downloading so basically our code is uh, executed and the results are saved when the binary package is built by CRAN. So in this step here, uh, so regardless of when you install it on your computer it does it doesn't really matter it's when cran if you're downloading in from from cran it's when cran built the binary is when the code is run uh, and when you load the library the cache results are made available to use and if you are actually on like a um, on a Linux system, or if you're installing a package from source, then when you're when you're installing, you're implicitly also building the package, and that's when the code is also executed. Um, right, so that's that's like the main difference between a code in a script and a code in a package. Uh, there are a few real world examples that they go over. One of this is this system. I think as we talked about this the last time also, uh, is if you had a line like this in your uh, script, this would tell you the exact time when your script was run, when that line of the script was run. But if you had this in the package, this time would be when the package was built. Then there are some like real world examples from the wild actually. Uh, so this is an example from this source code of this package called Shiny Bootstrap 2. And this package had this code in its code base at some point. And what it's doing is it's creating this object called data table dependency. And at some point during creation of this object, it's actually calling the function system file. Uh, here and here, which is pulling the the output of that function is the path to this file in the in this package. It gives you the full path, uh, and this so this would 
work fine as long as the package was built and is being used on the same machine. Uh, but it won't work in any other situation if because in when the package is this code will be run when the package is built, not when the package is used, which means that the the paths that will that system file will capture will be the path on the machine that the code is being built on and the package is being built on not the machine that the package is being used on. And uh, there is a very simple fix to this and this is the a screenshot of like the the uh, changes in the commit that fixed this problem uh, and all this is doing is basically this getting rid of this but all this is doing is putting all of this into a function and when we actually need whatever this big object is we run this in this function so instead of just calling that object we call that function and when we call this function this function is then run on the user's machine and the appropriate file uh, path is then like expected that's a real world example another one is when you are developing a package and you want to use a function from another package and you just use that function as is and you don't want to make any changes so you could make create an alias like this but this is a bad practice because what this means is when a user is using your function your package when they run the function foo they are actually calling the function blah from package b from the version of package b that's installed on your computer when you build the package and to get around that what you want to do is create this function inside of that function you call package b blah function and when when a user in this case when the user is calling using function foo they're actually calling the function blah that's in from the package B that's installed on their computer. Another reason why this is bad practice is if, if package B gets updated, the only way that you are the user of your function, your package, will get access to that updated uh, function blah is if you like I think like three things have to happen. One is that you have to update package B on your computer, then you rebuild your package, and then the user has to reinstall your package. When all when these three things happen, then the user will get access to this updated function. Otherwise, there's no way for that to happen. When this happens, then it's very simple. Like if the user updates the package B, then that's what they get the updated. Uh, function from that um, and yeah, so that's about like understanding when the difference between when code is run in a script versus uh, in a package and I think we have to like think about code differently in the two uh, situations does anybody have any questions before I move to the next section okay. so the next section is respecting the r landscape and by r landscape what we mean is not just the functions and the objects that are available but the global settings in the r uh, landscape i guess for example all the settings that are that can be changed through options parameter uh, options function for example uh, and the and here are some like examples of actions that change the r landscape uh, one is if you call the load a function load a package with library you are changing the um, search space so when then 
after calling library, if you type the name of a function, it's going to be searched in like a namespace that now is exposed because of that library call, which wouldn't have been otherwise. So you're actually changing the R landscape by calling library function. Changing global options with options function or changing the working directory. Like the, the way to know when you're, you've changed the landscape is if your function after run, if behavior of other function changes after running your function, it means that you have changed something about the R landscape. Uh, and here are some tips to avoid changing the landscape. One is never use library or require when you're developing a package, use the description file to declare your uh, dependencies. That will also ensure that those packages are actually installed when your package is being installed, if they're not already installed on the user's computer. Uh, never use source because source also runs the coding and changes the environment because it makes available all the objects from uh, the from that environment into uh, the global environment. And here are some like other like, non-exhaustive list of functions that you could use with cost like options, set WD card, uh, setting uh, changing the seed for random number generator. Uh, so basically, you don't want to, you want to avoid changing the landscape of the users R uh, session. That's like, uh, like a rule of a best practice. And the flip side of that is that you also don't want to rely on some, something from the R landscape. For example, you don't want to rely on some, some setting in the options uh some options that can that the user may have changed for example for some reason and then one of the examples that they give is the when you in i think before uh maybe this was before 4.0 or maybe even before that that read csv the base read dot csv had string as factors uh turned to true by default and you could change that through the options now it's changed now it's set to false by default but it's still uh, i think the logic still applies that you don't want to rely on like string as factors being true or false for example uh, set in the options but you you don't you don't always have the luxury to not touch the r landscape like sometimes you do have to touch the r landscape or you sometimes you do have to make changes and the, if you do have to do it, then you should clean up after yourself. Like, don't uh, don't leave the users' our session uh, uh, changed. Like, or always revert it back to wherever, however you found it when you uh, run it. There are a few ways of doing a few like examples that they talk about. They talk about this with R first, but I think it's easier to talk about on exit first, and then we'll talk about with R. So what on exit does is, so, so, uh, is when you want to change something, some option, uh, you can actually uh, schedule that for uh, schedule for that to happen one when your function is exited basically so here so temp file just like generates a random like a file name uh, that you can use for temporary file so you're just creating that file name and you want to create a temporary file that's what you want to do here which means that you're changing the users like landscape but you are also scheduling for that file to be deleted with unlinked scratch file on exit. So before you actually do this, so I think you could, 
So one could argue that you can actually just like write, like run this command and link scratch file at the end of your function uh, definition. But I think the, the benefit of actually using on exit is that regardless of how you exit the function, that command will be run. Like if, you, if the function finishes running successfully and exits, it, it will uh, run on exit. But even if the function errors out and ex you exit out of that function, you still make sure to like clean up with that on exit uh, call. And this add equals to is basically, I think if you have multiple such on exit things, then you want to like add to them and not replace the previous on exit uh, commands. And the with, with R is basically, it's heavily inspired by the base on exit. So it's pretty much the same thing, I think, uh, but it provides some like, it's like dev tools, I think, I don't know if it's like, are technically part of dev tools but it's sort of like dev tools where it like simplifies stuff for you yeah um, uh, so the general pattern of how which are works is also it like captures the original state before you do anything then you schedule the restoration like you do with on exit but here you use a function called defer and then you do whatever you want to do. And once you exit the function, those changes will be restored by uh, uh, defer. So in this case, this these are these functions like options or par. The thing about these functions is that if you change them, like, like here, options, mfro, uh, c22, and ttys. If you, if you change these, what it's going to do is it's going to change that, but it's also going to return the original state of what, whatever the previous uh, settings were. So we are just capturing the, pre we're changing the settings, but we're also at the same time capturing the original settings old. And then we're set, setting these to be restored with the defer function. The nice thing about the Vithar defer is that you don't have to use it on you. It doesn't, it also works outside of a function. So if you are testing your code in like just interactively in, an, in your ID, you can actually set these things in the global environment. And so, which means that you can like test out a lot of stuff. And if you can't do, and then uh, to like, to like trick it into actually executing this defer action when you're not actually running a function is like running this defer clear and there's another function that does the same thing which acts like as if you're like exiting a function and it will like restore the state to its previous uh, state so this makes it easy to interactively like test stuff because if you can't do that it's really hard to uh, apparently like test this like on exit stuff if you can't like experiment with it outside of the function. So that's like one of the nice things about using with R that you can't do this on exit with it. Then if you have to create some side effects like printing a plot or like creating a plot or printing some output to the console, then a good practice is to isolate those functions. If you have a function that like does some data wrangling and creates a plot, then instead of writing one function, write two functions. One function that does the data wrangling, second function that reads the wrangled data and makes the and only makes the plot. That also ensures that users then don't have to rely on your like plot making function, like the side effect creating function. They can just use the wrangled data and like do whatever they want with it. Another, so this is, I think when you're changing state or like creating side effects within a function, but sometimes you also need to do stuff when you're actually like loading your package. Like sometimes you have to, you want to display a message uh, like I think 
this most of the tidy was packages display some sort of a message when they're loaded i think um or if you want to change like set some custom options that are used in your package then you want to use this set of functions called on load or on attach and they um, they basically as the name suggests like those actions will happen when the package is loaded this library so like the package started message for example uh by conventions these on load uh, things are stored in like r slash zzz dot r file and if you do use on load then you also want to i guess clean up on on load similar to like on its uh i guess that's like the main like takeaways of the chapter this is another like the good practices reminder sort of thing about constant health checks so similar like similar to what we talked about earlier just load r you want to like iterate quickly so the typical sequence of things that like you want to be going through when you're developing a package is like create a function by like editing one or more like, files in r then you want to like run the document function load r run some examples interactively then run test then run check and experienced developers go through this cycle quickly and frequently and if you're not comfortable with doing this iteratively you have a tendency to like uh get into like this a dysfunctional workflow which looks where you don't regularly test basically you may uh, edit something build the package you might like you may not write documentation simultaneously or you may not write tests as you're writing functions you might wait for like your functions to be done and that's like a, not a good idea and you might be doing some like interactive tests of your uh, edits to make sure your function works like as expected but those interactive uh, checks can't always find like the uh, can't always find bugs especially in like edge cases for that you want to when you're writing functions simultaneously at the same time i think while you're thinking about that stuff you should write tests that specifically test all the things that uh, can go wrong basically and i think this is uh, uh, i don't know if previous chapters had this but they said that they're going to end all chapters with some like cran notes if you want to uh, um, submit to cran basically and the note cran note for this chapter was that if you're submitting to cran you can only use ascii characters in your data files so basically alphanumeric and some common punctuation and if you do need to use some like uh, greek letters or whatever uh, then you can use that uh, do that with some like this special unicode escape uh, format for example this is like the if you want to add a bullet this is the unicode uh, escape uh, format for the bullet and they are actually identical uh, and you can find the i think you can find the unicode escape format by running this function actually but uh, if you don't have some non ascii characters so that's the cram not and i think that's that's everything we have for this chapter got one for you aaron if that's all right um related to this unicode comment uh, i have ran into this before from a tech writing perspective uh, when users copy and paste from multiple formats uh, a classic case is microsoft word and some of the uh, more fancier rich text type uh, encoding when you copy that and put it into another file sometimes those special characters will error out on you uh, especially if you're converting over to html 
Uh, HTML is very ASCII oriented unless you specifically tell it to run a different language or a different uh, Unicode. Um, this has been a problem in the past and I can always catch it usually. Um, again, I'm using that Atom environment and I, I know I'm referring back to it, but you can, you can do our related details in Atom as well. The nature or the reason that that is an important element is catching some of these. This chapter is discussing some of the internal workings or internal methods uh, within the IDE or, or package development to catch some of these errors. Um, there are other tools, I guess, that also for, uh, provide those formatting or um, the edge case comments that you were making um, would, would notice some of these copying and paste errors uh, that, that, that may uh, encroach in your, in your development time. You can, um, can't you get like a, an ace key, like character list on your, through your terminal? Isn't there a way to do that? Uh, the way, the way I found it, I think is like, you just do like ace key, like uh, or man a ski or whatever it is man a ski or something at least on a mac i think that will give you all like the hmm. the a ski characters i think if you go man a ski on a, it's on windows or not windows but on a mac computer in your terminal it should give you a, a complete table yeah. of your character listing i think unless i'm looking at something completely wrong <laughs> Um, I like the, the one thing, the one thing that I like the one critique that I have from like the chapter is like the art, the, the language around our landscape, because when I first read that, I was thinking as like holistically all are not the user's environment. And so I don't know, I don't know if, I don't know if, if uh, Hadley or Jenny Bryant's watching this later, if you are, you know, ex excellent piece of work. The book's awesome. But when I read that part of it, I was just like, are you talking about like R as in like the entire world or are you talking about like the user's computer? And so that's that part for me was kind of confusing. I had to read it a couple of times to be like, oh, we're talking about the if we pass it off into another environment. So I think the use of that language there was a little confusing, but um, after you read it a couple of times, it started to make sense. But. I don't know, did anybody else have that same experience when they were reading? I saw some people shaking their heads. Yeah, I mean, the landscape, the, the word is more, I guess, evocative. You, know, you think of like R, like the whole, the world of our language itself. So. Hmm. Yeah, I was wondering for that section, so 7.5, where they talk about using the with our package and everything. Um, it, even though this is specific or they're talking about our packages, it makes me wonder, are these just like general principles that are good to have in terms of like only temporarily changing your environment or setup just for scripts in general? Or is it okay to be more, you know, loose in that case? Uh, I think, If you're, I think at least the way I think about it is that uh, if you're writing scripts that rely on some like, like a non-default option, I think that's like a not, then your code is not reproducible because it's not going to work the same on your computer as on somebody else's computer, I guess. Um, yeah, like you can like change some things in your like, like your R profile uh, file, for example, but like, like it's a bad idea to like, for example, have a library called to a function or to a package in your R profile. So every time your R session starts, that library is loaded, I guess. Uh, and then 
you could write a script without the call to the library, but then it wouldn't work for anybody else. Um, but I think there is a way to do that. Like you can run some commands at the when you start your R session, only if you are in an interactive session, I guess. Um, right, that makes sense. Yeah, this one, this part is kind of challenging because like I only really started to understand the use of on.exit when you start thinking about like when your package gets sent to somebody else's computer because you don't necessarily know what state their computer is going to be in, right? And like Aaron said, it was just like there might be some crazy options that somebody has set out there that you don't know about. And so like people do some wacky things with their computers. And so it's just like, you got to take that into consideration. And so you don't want to mess with their setup and you can't necessarily rely on like the default settings of what comes with R because, you know, there might be changes. I'm, I'm sure there's probably changes that happen to those default settings, depending on the operating system too. I'm not sure. And someone should correct me if I'm like, you know, off base with that, but there might be some other options that are dependent on like which operating system you're using as well. So it's like, it's just not best to rely, at least from my understanding, because I don't totally understand the whole use of with R, but just not to rely on those default options. Cause you just don't know when you put something on CRAN, you, you don't know what somebody's going to use your package for, whether that be for good things or bad things. And so it's just good practice to kind of consider like what happens with your package when you pass it on. So well, was, if you don't mind, Colin, I'm going to correct just a comment that that you made there. Uh, so your binary is going to be built around the operating system that you're deploying it on. So I think that is going to be taken care of by the compiler itself, right? So so if you're packaging it for Windows, if you're packaging it for Mac, if you're packaging it, packaging it for Linux, et cetera, or excuse me, let me rephrase that. Linux is designed to be built uh, on-premise when you install it, and if you need to compile it at that point. Mac and Windows require that the binary package be compiled and put on CRAN so that the uh, call to install that package, it knows what version to grab from. I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm going outside the fence here, outside of our studio to try and help convey the, the thought process of this different environmental variables. Take, for example, if the user doesn't have read-write access to an area that your program that they've installed is trying to access, the program would error out or the, the, the script would error out. Um, that would be an example of, of something that we can't take into account. There's no way a developer is going to, to figure that out. But if by using these uh, uh, base uh, functions or, or the with R function, you're creating your own user space for the session to operate uh, in a safe area regardless of, of what environment that, that user's computer is in. Uh, maybe I'm not, I'm not being specific. The thought that came to mind, what I'm stressing over or what I'm trying to convey is user rights specifically. In a Linux environment, uh, a user's ability to access certain areas must be elevated to run, I don't know, uh, sudo uh, or super user, right? You have to elevate your credentials to, to operate something. You don't want to always be in that state. Uh, it's not a safe practice to, to follow. Um, that would be something that as developers running this particular script, if we're trying to access that space that the user may not have access to, they're never going to be able to run our package. Um, does that help maybe? I, I, I wanted to just correct the 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 binary thought process of, of operating system itself, um, that would be taken care of when you're compiling it to that service. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. I, I think I think the main thing that I was trying to get at was like, you don't know where your package is gonna be and how it's gonna be used. And so right. it's yeah, just important. It's important to know that if you are gonna change whatever state your package is being used in, clean up, you know, make it go back to that state, whatever it was before. And so your package should be like an isolated unit. But again, like that conversation of like where packages get used, I just don't have enough experience to, to say outside of just 
hey, clean up after yourself. <laughs> well, I haven't I haven't ran into the reading yet where this point occurs, and I I, I have reason to believe it's the description folder uh, or or a directory. Has anybody ran into a point where you uh, have a uh, you install a package and then you get this prompt that says, uh, oh, hey, by the way, you need to install these other packages as well. I, uh, it, it happens as like a warning at the very top of your, of your uh, console. It's not your console, it's, uh, it's the editing window. Um, if you go to open an R file and you don't have, there's a, there's a library call inside there, but you don't have that package installed on your, your environment, it'll automatically prompt you and say, hey, by the way, you need to install this other package as well. Is that a function of that running environment or is that a description folder in the package if you were I, to install it that way? I think I think I think I know what you're talking about. And I think I don't think that has to do with the packages, any of the packages. I think that's an like a R Studio uh, like uh, feature where like R Studio will detect yeah. library calls. And if it if you don't if it sees that you don't have them installed, it'll like uh, make that banner suggesting that. I see. And then it can also like, if you click it, it will just like do the installation for you. I think that's like an R Studio feature. Okay, very good. I was gonna make one last comment and it was a last thought that I had uh, related to, uh, I think it was on load or on attach, I think were the two functions. If I scroll to the bottom of the section, there was a, a reference to those two points of being, here's the older style of, of doing it. Uh, yeah. And then the newer, the newer style of doing it. Um, yeah. Has anybody ran the Spark, uh, Sparkler uh, environment on your machine? Uh, so Spark is obviously a different storage mechanism or a different uh, format of memory uh, uh, allocation. Point being, if you load that, these are connectors. So uh, if you have a script running and you're calling on Sparkler, obviously you have to have the Spark environment running as well. Uh, I was curious if that is where that on load or on attach uh, point comes in, because you need to make sure that that utility's operating, that environment's operating so that your package can also interact with it as well. Just a thought. I'm not familiar. Um, they, they have a they have an SQL uh, connector as well. I, I, it is connections. If you if you go to the very top, uh, or I guess on your machine, wherever that, that uh, window is located. It would be the environmental history connections build and get if you're using a version control. Um, but if you have a, a, a DB connection, um, like, like Postgres or some other sort of database uh, link um, or Spark specifically, uh, I thought this on load or on attach uh, might be a method to validate that that application is running on uh, as well as the uh, script, uh, the package load itself. Wow. Uh, yeah, I see. I see what you're saying. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Somebody to jump in. Yeah. No, hey. I was just going to say that I think I've like sometimes loaded packages that require you to be connected to the internet, and they like tell you if you're not. So I'm wondering if that's also done through like on load. Like when you load it, check whether you have internet connection and print a message or something. Point. Um, I know exactly what you're talking about, Ryan. Um, there's a package that I use called Google Analytics R. Um, well, and and Big R Query too does this as well, but because those packages, what they do is their main purpose is to make connections to an outside service via an API. And to do that, you have to have some form of credentialing with that. So either you run through a, like an OAuth2 
credentialing to get like a cookie or something or a token, or you can go through like to, or you can go through and have like a, um, a JSON key set up. And so like how those packages are set up, it's like, you have to have like a certain dot R environment file. You have to have like the dot R environment file pointing to your authentication file so that the package actually can run. And it just made me a little bit curious and I'm just doing some digging into it now and how that actually checks that. And if that is the dot, on, if that's the, you know, the, the dot on attach or dot on load. I'm not hundred percent mm. sure, but it's kind of that same thing where, you know, you need to have like a certain setup for the package to actually work. And so like, what's doing that actual checking? Am I on, am I on base or am I off? I think that's an accurate comment uh, because it, it is, a, it, it's a validator of the environment that you're running your package in. Uh, we all we all know obviously this is an R subject, so it's going to be an R environment that can be without stating. But uh, these additional ancillary services must also be connected. Aaron mentioned the uh, possibly internet connection or or calling your comment of authentication, etc. I'm I'll I'll look into it more. I'll uh, I'll try and find my. Uh, question, I'll try to answer the question and, and post it to the rest of the group. There's another package called, um, I think it's called Gargle. And so the whole purpose of Gargle is to like ease the, or to ease the authentication between like any of like, uh, like uh, to ease the authentication into Google APIs. So like if you want to use like any API through Google, you have to authenticate. And so like Gargle, is like kind of the main workhorse behind a lot of those packages that interface with Google services. Um, it may have a mechanism like you're looking for, but I'd have to do some more digging to really understand, but now you got me kind of curious about it. I also found in reviewing the chapter, uh, the uh, to-do tags uh, were a little bit of a speed bump for me as I'm reading through, it's like these personal Hadley Wickham notes or, or author notes of, hey, make sure in the next revision of the document, uh, modify this or change this. Uh, I found that a little funny. Yeah. I think one of the fun things I find about reading this book is, uh, it like it reminds me of like some function in some package and like makes me wonder if like that package is doing something that function is doing something like you know a certain way like the discussion that we are just having about like on load i guess yeah well that that and i had that same experience this week too because you know right now i'm working because I'm, I'm working on a package as well and i say it's already nine o'clock so if somebody has to jump off go ahead um, you know, um, but I had that same experience too, where it's like, I'm finding myself digging more into like other packages, and how they do it, because there's something I want to do. And the one like experience that I had was like, use this has a function where you can create templates. So like a side effect would be like, say you're, so the purpose of my package is basically to create like a, a monthly report, right? It just creates a report. And so part of that is, is building a template for like different steps that you have to do to build a report. And so like use this has a function in it that allows you to make a template that's embedded within your package. And so it was just kind of like, it's kind of nice to go like dig into the package and be like, well, how do they actually use the templates? Because that's what use this is doing is it's like, it's creating templates for certain things. And I was just like, yeah. So I had that same experience as you, Aaron is just like, yeah. <laughs> you you start to see what like you you really start to kind of learn the structure of these packages. Granted, I can't I can't figure out all the functions, especially if I dig through deep fire. But you start seeing some of these conventions used, and it's like, oh, I know what this is doing now. So, um, but uh, Ryan, I just dug into this this gargle package that does it in their on dot load. What they do is they call a function called cred fung set default, which I would assume is when that function runs, is it checks if the credentials are all set up. So that's probably what it does, but. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good example. So anything else? 
so I'll just kind of say some some final comments. We can kind of hang out, talk a little bit more. If people want to kind of hang out um, and talk, um, Aaron, thanks a lot for taking on the speaking responsibilities tonight. Excellent job. Uh, great discussion from everybody. Um, next week, we'll cover chapter eight. Um, Isabella has signed up. I'll double check to make sure that she's still good to go on chapter number eight. And then um, if people are interested in signing up again for another chapter, I know I'm due up. I've been kind of sitting backseat for a little bit, so I'll take on a chapter here in the next couple of weeks. Um, but if you're interested in any of these chapters that are coming up, you know, please go ahead and sign up. You have you have the link. And so other than that, I mean, I'll hang out for a little bit. If people want to chat other than that, have a good rest of your evening. Thanks. Have a good evening.